immense pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Professor Jack Meadows. Before I introduce him, I will actually tell why and how that this particular talk came about. Some time back, maybe about three months back, when Professor Ramaya was interacting with me on a personal note, and he told that we are going to have an international conference in Pondicherry University, organized by Library and Information Sciences, backed up by our dynamic library. So we'll have this conference, and uh, my guide, PhD guide, uh, Professor Jack Meadows will be here. And he is a specialist in information sciences. And also, he comes from the background of science, that is physics, all the way to astrophysics. I'm sure, as a professor emeritus at Loughborough University, he must have done a bridge between the science and other fields of research, particularly social sciences. I said, why not? You know, why not we organize one at a very generic talk for everybody to listen? I, for one, would be too happy to listen to this uh, Professor Jack Meadows. That's all is this genesis. And Professor Jack Meadows is here, who traveled all the way from Lauboro. When I heard Lauboro for the first time, I said, sir, I would like to tell you that whether it's a loft borough, as we know how to tell, or it's a just a Lauboro or a borough itself. But it's a Lauboro, which is very close to Lister. Uh, Lister is a place where the highest density of Indian population in UK is there. And I'm sure Professor Lavaro, uh, sorry, Professor Jack Meadows from Lavaro would have loved to Indians and things like that. He's a professor. He was a professor at Lister. Before that, uh, you know, taking up information sciences, he was working on astrophysics, astronomy, history of science, and whatnot. You know, from that spectrum to this spectrum. So he must be a complete professor in many respects in that way. Then he was a professor of library and information sciences. Uh, and he, since 1986 to 2001 at Loughborough University, head of the Department of Information Science, head of the Library Information Statistics Unit, head of the Center for Computers in LIS Teaching. I don't know whether if you left out any field of science or arts, it was, you must have touched every one field. It will be really uh, nice of him to agree to our request to give a talk here. And I would not take much time. We're already running behind 15 minutes. And you know, I requested Professor, Lau Professor Meadows to give a talk for about 45 minutes. Then I want that uh, the uh, students and faculty of uh, in the audience here should interact with him. Well, I begin by, by thanking a few people, and first of all the Dean for the honour of inviting me, thank you sir. May I say incidentally how glad I am to see the library doing well here, and I passed the library building, so my congratulations to the librarian and her staff. I'd like to thank my old friend and colleague Professor Amaya, you may not think of him as a research student, but I remember him when he was like this, you see, and it is very good of him to arrange all this visit. And finally, of course, I have to thank all of you for coming this afternoon when you could have been doing something else. Just a quick talk about what has interested me most of my life, which is how people communicate research to each other and to the community. Now, various ways of looking at this. Small scale, how I communicate information to you, or large scale, what is the system as a whole? Today I'm going to talk about the second one. What is the system for communicating science? Now, what I want to do is to start in the past and to talk about trends, how things have been changing. Then I will come up to the present day and say, well, what is the situation now? And I will end by saying, well, what can we do for the future? So I start then back in time. And back in time was when I was a student, a research student myself, about 200 years ago. Okay? And when I was a research student, I used to stand around drinking tea and listening to the senior people talking. And the senior people, most of the time, 
were complaining about how much literature, how much more scientific literature there was than when they had been young. So I heard that. Okay. That's fair enough so far as it goes, but it doesn't alter the fact that the total amount of literature is much, much bigger now than it was in 1826. What is the result? The result, of course, is specialisation. A professor of chemistry nowadays is much more specialised in what he studies than was Michael Faraday. Specialisation. And you can see it in the communication system. Have you come across this journal called the Philosophical Magazine? I, I choose it because a colleague of mine wrote the history of the company who published this table in Francis. And we looked at this journal in particular because it has been going for 200 years. It has continuous history for 200 years. And there are not many journals that have that. In the early journals, the early days, it started around 1800. And it covered all science, any science. By 1900, it covered only physics. By 2000, it covers condensed matter. And in fact, condensed matter is in three different divisions, so uh, a particular one is even more specialised than that. What you see then in all journals is the way they specialise as time passes, as are the people who do research. Another thing I'd notice, and <coughs> just in passing, uh, but I want to press further on with it later, is collaboration. People may specialise, but nature does not specialise. So if you study nature, you have to have people with different specialisms together. Yeah. We use statisticians to help us with statistics. I certainly need that throughout my life. Computer operators to help us make sure our computer uh, <coughs> language, our computer programs is satisfactory. We do not do things by ourselves now. We always have other people with other special knowledge working with us. And that too comes over in the literature. If you look at papers, you will find that they increase. This is the slowest increase. You may see faintly there are other lines here. You get number of authors, period of time, 1975 up to whatever it is, 1995. Number of authors going up, depending which line you take, from about two and a half up there to considerably more. The multi-author paper is a reflection of the fact that we have to collaborate with other people. Now, an important point, and that is, I'm talking about the whole system of science, but each part of science has its own characteristic. A chemist does not write papers and publish and communicate in exactly the same way as a biologist, and so on. So, really speaking, we have to think about subjects a little bit separately. They are all expanding, but there are differences. And here is an example. Number of authors of papers by subject. This is the 1990s, incidentally. And what you can see is, if you look at it, that um, Not so many, even this is what, 15 years, 10 to 15 years ago, not so many single author papers, nearly all biochemical papers have more than one author. Um, psychology, not quite so bad. Economic sociology, most papers are still single author. In other words, collaboration is really something for science more than for other subjects, although in economics and sociology it's increasing. So remember, Subject differences on what I say. Let me skip that. Even despite this, even though collaboration allows you to specialise, there is so much literature, even in English specialism, crazy or lightning, that the amount of reading an individual scientist has to do has increased and is increasing with time. Here are some uh, American figures. As you can see, average number of articles read per university faculty member, in other words, you, how many articles are you reading each year? 
And you can see how it is increasing. This is 1977 down here. 2004, 2006 over here. And this has gone from 150 articles per year, which is about one every two days, up to 271, which means you only have a, a holiday occasion. Yeah? So things are, the increase in literature has had a lot of effects. It has made us specialize, it has made us collaborate with each other, and it has made us read more. So it has driven our communication system. A few points. One point here is that we don't only read journals, of course, we read other things. And I put this up to remind you that this too is dependent upon the subject that you study. If you compare, for example, chemistry here, no doubt Dean will tell me if this is what he does, uh, with computer science over there, you will see that there's considerable difference in the sources, the extent to which the amount to which they rely on different sources. The other point I, I note out to you is that the um, sources here are different types. Colleagues, for example, this is usually called informal communication. You and I meet over a cup of tea and we talk. That is, we pass on information. Informal. Whereas something printed like a left read article is formal, which is there outside us. There are differences in both of these according to your subject area. I should say, incidentally, that my colleagues in the arts departments drink a lot of tea, and therefore you will find that conversation with colleagues is about 50% of their information source. Scientists have less time for tea. One final point I want to talk about is peer review. You know, you write a paper, you send it to a journal, it goes out to a referee, the referee looks at it, it tears it into pieces and sends it back. Yes? Peer review. This is important. I mean, if you ask the scientists, do you want your journal to, uh, your paper to appear, your article to appear in a referee journal, they always say, yes, yes, it must be referee. So it's important for scientists. But notice that this also <coughs> is subject dependent. Take a look at the differences. Rejection rates. I, I'm happy to tell you that chemistry papers are rejected more often than physics papers. <laughs> but the good thing to notice is that down here, our colleagues in the arts and social science departments have their papers rejected much more often. Now, there are two reasons for this. One is about the nature of the subject. Chemists, for the most part, agree what is good research and what is not good research. And so when you send it out to a referee, you may not thoroughly like their comments, but they are working on the same framework as you. Whereas in history, different people have different frameworks. So a Marxist historian would not be the same as a conservative historian, for example. The other thing is money. Much of what we've been talking about comes down to money. Because to do research requires money. Well, there is quite a lot of money in physics, biology, chemistry. There is some in economics and sociology. But there is not much money in philosophy or history. Therefore, there is not much money to print, sell journals, or people buy them. So it is partly economic. There are not enough journals to publish all the history papers. Whereas there are enough journals to publish all the physics papers. And uh, abstracts, uh, rather than put up another picture up showing journal titles, how they increase, I thought I would put up one that showed how the number of abstracts being published increased. And can you see that the line there is the same line as the journal? The, the only change is that the dates are different. If you see the dates down the bottom, you will see they actually go up to last year. So what I'm saying is that the past is also the present. Exponential increase is still here. 
calculate when you started research and when you were going to finish research. And if it is 40 years, then there will be five times as many papers for you to read at the end as there were at the beginning. Justice for my supervisor, justice for Michael Faraday. Now, there is an important point behind all this, which is money. Because why are papers increasing so rapidly in number? And the answer, of course, is because the number of researchers is increasing rapidly. Now, these figures here, 1980 to 1995, show the researchers against the journals, against the articles. And they're all increasing roughly at the same rate. Articles are a little faster, but by and large, the exponential increase in the amount of literature is because there's an exponential increase in the amount of researchers. You. And that costs money. So there's an exponential increase in the amount of money being spent on science. Here's the estimates, and uh, um, don't take them very seriously, but these are rough estimates of how much, <coughs> how many researchers there are in the world that have been over the last 10 years. And you can see that the increase continues to be rapid. Now, the point I want to make is that this is total number of researchers in the world, everywhere. Can you read this or not? Let me just read a bit of it in case you have difficulty at the side. Scientific productivity of several developing countries has increased significantly over the past decade. And I, I should add that there is a strong belief in the United Kingdom that we should stop using the word developing countries because they are more or less developed. You know? As a result of political support for science and heavy investment, that is the point there, China, India, Brazil, and South Africa, that are the only developing country representatives among 31 countries that produce 97.5% of the research output of the world. The other 162 countries produce less than 2.5%. Now, what do we deduce from this? What does this mean? What it means is the countries I mentioned, particularly China, India, and Brazil, are the people who are now producing the exponential increase in research. Western Europe, United States, is still growing, but the reason that it's still exponential is because developing countries have begun to add their weight to it. So, all this is your fault, yeah? And specialization continues. This is an area that has interested me, so I just mention it as an example. Quantum computing in 1990 didn't exist. It was virtually not talked about or thought about very much. The first successful experiments were 1998, less than 15 years back. The first journal appeared in 2001, and then other journals followed afterwards. So now, a subject that did not exist 20 years ago has a whole number of journals about it active today. Specialization hasn't stopped, it continues, of course. This one might interest you, I put it in. An issue of Nature Today, and Nature, you will, you will know the UK journal Nature, I guess, an uh, issue of Nature Today has nearly the same number of articles as in 1950, 60 years back, but about four times as many authors to each article. The lone author has all but, dis uh, all but disappeared. Collaborations has really got going. And the, it is the reason I put this is so you can read the last sentence there. If they, the authors, could do enough work by themselves and could spare the time and effort to do so, it would not matter because their funding agencies and their home institutions would not allow them to work by themselves. In other words, collaboration it is not something that you have to do yourself. It is, but it's also because other people expect you to. 
collaboration, therefore, another factor going on. Multi-author papers, therefore, multi-author papers. And one of my uh, hobbies is to see what is the paper with the largest number of authors. Now, I wonder if you can guess. Well, let me put up there. These are multi-author, incidentally. Uh, that is p the number of papers each year with more than 50 authors. And the bottom line here, <coughs> sorry, I should point it to that. that is the number of papers on this scale <coughs> from 1993 up to the present with more than 50 authors. But the bottom line there is the number of papers with more than 500 authors. Yeah. Well, I put this up as an example. As you might expect, there are certain parts of science which go in for collaboration more than other parts. And one of those is high energy physics. Now, uh, I took at random a paper, high energy physics paper, and here are the first few authors. We're talking about a thousand author paper here. You know? And you can see they are in alphabetical order. And I put this up to remind you. The important thing is always to have a name that begins with A. And in this case, even better, it begins with AA. You see? <laughs> because this paper, when it is referred to in the literature as it has been, is referred to as being by Altonen et al. and all the others. So if you're the first author, you do very well. But, you know, yeah, thousand, the, the highest number I, I've found so far is nearly 3,000. So, collaboration, collaboration, but subject dependent still, depends on your subject. Well now, before we go on to talk about what is happening, what is going to come up, let's stop for one minute and say, well, okay, but it is the authors, really, who decide this. It is you who decide what you want to do, what you want to publish, and where you want to publish. So what do researchers want from the system we have? Well, visibility is the first one. You, 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 do, you want your name to be known to other people. I want my name to be known to other people. Prestige. You like to publish in some channel, some journal, which everybody has heard about, and everybody says, oh, that's a good place to publish. You want it to be reasonably speedy. You don't want to send a paper in today and it not to appear for another year. And at least if you're like me, you want to do with the least amount of work for all those things to be true. Okay, well keep these in mind and let's see where we are going. Have any of you come across this, I wonder, this website? It's one of my favourite websites. Now, I'll tell you why. What it is, uh, I'm afraid it's not too visible, but it is uh, an astronomy, astrophysics website. And what it is, you, you have a picture of a galaxy here, and then on the right, it tells you how to classify the galaxy, how to decide what sort of galaxy it is. Yeah. So you are taught how to classify online. Now, what happens is there's a big survey of the sky, using millions and millions of these pictures, with about 10 people doing it. And that is not enough people to classify any but a very small number. So what they have done is to call in the amateur astronomers. They put these up on the website, and there are 20,000 amateur astronomers who uh, every year classify these galaxies. And as a result, several million galaxies have been classified now. Now, from the point of view of the professional author, this is very good. They could not do this work by themselves, so they have collaborated. But they have collaborated with amateurs who do not wish to have their names on the paper that is published. So the authors publish a paper, get prestige, get their names recognised, but the people who do the work just have to have acknowledgement and they are happy with that. So there are ways, you see, in which you can get research done and still get acknowledged very strongly yourself. Unfortunately, not many. This is amateur astronomers. There, there are not very many amateur high-energy physicists, for example. So a high-energy physicist cannot use this. Moreover, remember what we had under nature there, that there was pressure to publish in collaboration. 
Well, here is another example. I don't know if you know about the human genome, the project to produce the classification of the human genome. Each group, it's a big project, so each group wanted to do their own work. But the governments, governments in Europe and in the United States said no. If we are going to provide money, you must publish all the data together. So GenBank, in fact, is a collaborative project, not because the authors wanted to be collaborative, but because the people who gave them the money wanted them to be collaborative. So pressures from inside, but increasingly as time passes now, pressures on you to collaborate from outside. Let me change topic for a moment. Open access journals. The point being that one of the problems has been money for journals. The cost of journals has been going up very rapidly, as I'm sure you know. The ability to buy them, therefore, has gone down. And the result has been people have been trying to publish journals which do not cost a lot of money, which are free access, and these are the open access journals. They started a little while ago. Down here is, what is it? This is 1990s down here and you come up to the present day up here, and you can see they have been increasing quite nicely, but not too rapidly. <coughs> they are due to increase much more rapidly in the future. And here is an example of why. A few months ago, the United Kingdom government decided that it would insist material could be published freely for any research that it supported. The US government decided the same, but there is a big dispute in the United States about this at the moment. But if the people providing you with your money to do research say you must publish in free journals, then you must publish in free journals, you see. So those journals which are free have been growing slowly, but they will grow more rapidly in the future. You may not have come across archive, which is a, a higher, well, it's physics, astrophysics, um, electronic base, an electronic database, you put your papers in, no refereeing, and they appear. And notice how it has increased with time. The point about this, the reason I put this in, is you can see that it is expanding quite rapidly, not exponentially, but quite rapidly, it's doing very well, and it is unrefereed. So one of the moves that is going on is not only to try and publish in journals that cost a good money, but even in places which are not properly refereed. And uh, this is a bit about it. And again, you see, I go back that it is subject dependent. The physicists and astrophysics people are very happy with publishing in a non refereed source. They think they know what they are doing. But as it says here, scientists in other fields seem less willing. Biologists in particular are notoriously reluctant to discuss their own work or to have it in unrefereed journals. So, subject dependent again. Nature, to go back to Nature, which is a journal I know well, did actually try to take one step towards this by putting up articles and asking people outside to read them and referee them. Open refereeing. It didn't work. Let me stop and ask you to think of it. There is an article, and uh, you have the opportunity to referee it. Why would you not do so? Well, uh, various reasons, no doubt, but I'll tell you one strong one. That is, if you made rude comments about it, the people who published it would not be very pleased. And later on, they might referee your paper. So one of the things that uh, stopped it was the fact that people were not prepared to take the time or indeed the risk of refereeing. So open refereeing did not work. And in some subjects the archive thing would not work. Here is a statement from an archaeologist who said that if you tried to, to publish as in the archive of the physicist with no refereeing, he would stop being an archaeologist or rather he would say that archaeology was sociology and publishing sociology magazines. 
So subject dependent again, depending which subject you're in. There is one problem uh, beyond that, and that is that you want to publish in important prestige places, prestigious places. And these open access journals do not have prestige, so you don't want to publish. The way around that one has been to devise new journals which have all the really important people behind them, and then say they are publishing the fact. And for biologists, Public Library of Science is an example, a very good example, of people doing that. The third reviewer. If you look down this one, you see for scientists to share opinions about recent published research. And uh, if you look closely, you'll see down the bottom here, it says, because we want to foster honest, open discussion, you can contribute your thoughts anonymously. So you could have anonymous open reviewing, if you see what I mean. All these are different ways of modifying what you do in traditional journals, in printed journals. I think one final example, if I remember, is Mendeley, which is the only one of these which is UK, incidentally, the others are US. It is similar, though. You put a paper you're interested in, you put it on the, th the computer, and the uh, computer finds any other papers which seem to be similar. All these, in other words, are what is called collaborative filtering. And collaborative filtering doesn't depend on peer review. I really put this in to point out the whole of this kind of thing. Now this again is journal nature. Forgive me that I have worked with the nature people for many years, so I know what, what is happening better. They have a, an app now which allows you to get onto nature wherever you are and get what you want out of it. So portable and it covers everything, not just the peer-reviewed stuff, but a whole range of stuff. So let me summarise the end then. Research publication continues to grow, mainly due to people like you. Specialisation continues, but one of the great advantages of computers is that it is possible to communicate across subjects better. So cross-fertilisation is improved. Collaboration is still growing, as you can see, but the difference now, as compared with 20 years ago, is that it is much more international. Greater access, in other words, the journals are being opened up so that you can get to them more easily. Formal and informal channels, they, they now cross. If you put up a paper and somebody comments on it underneath, paper is formal, the comment is informal. Yeah, they're one thing. So you are dealing with formal and informal at the same time. The old distinction is disappearing. And finally, changes in peer review do depend on the field. But even the, the people who want peer review most are now beginning gradually to say, OK, we can relax things. So the summary is the effect of electronic communication is the way in which we communicate is now changing very rapidly. Thank you.